Well, good morning and welcome again, Unival Baptist Church. Can't believe that we've been here, gathering here at the church for the last eight weeks, including today. Can you believe it? Seemed like such a long time that we were away, and now God has given us the ability to do this. So we're glad that you joined us, and those of us uh, who are joining online as well, we welcome you. And as we begin our time together, I invite you to just join with me in prayer as we commit this time once again to our Lord, that he would do with it what pleases him and what is for our good. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for calling us once again, calling us together as your people to worship. Those of us who are here in this room and those who are outside, Lord, we are one in Christ. We come together to seek your face, to worship you, to hear from you again. And we ask, Lord, that you would enable us to lay aside the distractions that are waiting there. Even legitimate things in our lives, Lord, concerns and issues that have to be dealt with. Grant us the grace, Lord, to leave them in your hands, that we might give you our undivided attention and worship and praise, and that we might seek and find as you invite us to come. And Lord, we look forward also the opportunity once again to get together in communion, those of us who are here in this room. We pray that we would not take for granted the privilege we have of coming together in this way. And so we just ask you to preside over our time together now, bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our opening hymns? And those of you following from home will be 176, 188 together, and then 512 afterwards. But beginning with 176, lead me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown now. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget Lest I forget 
forget thy love for me Lead me to Calvary Lest I forget Gethsemane Lest I forget thy agony Lest I forget thy love for me Lead me to Calvary Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Could He devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done, he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide, and shut its glories in. When Christ the mighty Maker died, for man the creature sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never pay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Is all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Cause it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. And then hymn number 512 in our hymnals. I stand amazed. In the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean For me it was in the garden He prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own grief, but sweat dropped of blood for mine. Thou marvelous, thou wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Thou marvelous, thou wonderful is my Savior. Angels beheld 
Father, we do thank you and praise you for your wonderful love and wonderful love of our Savior who willingly gave himself on that cross that we might be redeemed. We who were once at enmity with God now been brought near, and not for judgment but for forgiveness and that we might have life. Lord, may the truth of that always impact us, Lord, the way we live, the way we conduct our lives, the way we speak, interact with one another in this world. May we indeed reflect the reality that is ours, that we are in Christ. Though guilty as we are, yet through the blood of Jesus, pronounced righteous in his sight. Help us, Lord, to live such lives that before men that they would glorify our Heavenly Father, worship Him. Cause our lights to shine, Lord, your light in us in this dark world. So lest we forget the suffering and all that you have wrought for us on the cross, lead us again and again and again to Calvary to remember where it all began for us. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. And if you have your Bible, just like to read a, a short psalm, if you'd like to follow along, Psalm 2. It's actually reading number 691 in our hymnals, but it is Psalm number 2 that I'll just read for us to meditate on. The psalmist writes, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, 
the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. And as we continue in worship, I'm going to sing two more hymns from our hymn, number 14 and then number 10, which is our expression of this king who has been exalted. It's right for us to bow before him and acknowledge him, for he is the true king. Come, let us worship and bow down. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture. And the sheep of his hand, just the sheep of his hand. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Just the sheep of his hand, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Just the sheep of his hand, and the sheep of his hand, just the sheep of his hand. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, a pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise. Tell of His 
his might, who sing of his grace. Robe is the light, whose canopy space is chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. With its store of wonders untold, Almighty thy power hath found it of old, established it fast by a changeless degree, and round it hath cast like a bomb. Sight. It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Children of dust and feeble as frail, Thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. O measureless might, ineffable love, Angels delight to worship the above. All the creation, though feeble their lays, with true adoration shall all sing thy praise. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5. I'm going to read the entire chapter, and then this morning we're going to work our way through perhaps half of the chapter. Daniel chapter 5. Very familiar passage of scripture to many of us. Daniel chapter 5, the word of the Lord. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it rose, as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought, and said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Nebuchadnezzar, or King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. 
O king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. This man, Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read the writing, this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel, Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor because of the high position he gave him. All the peoples and nations and men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, O son o, o, o Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. This is what these words mean. Many. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought into and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and have been found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the king of the Babylonians was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now that you would open our minds and our hearts to be fed and nourished by you, that we would sit under your word that it might speak into our life with absolute authority and truth. So, Lord, bless us and encourage us, build into our lives, Lord, and bring us into the maturity of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. It would be unwise to read and interpret Daniel chapter 5 apart from Daniel chapter 4, indeed, from all that goes before. While we've said numerous times that the major theme of the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God, we see that chapter 4 and chapter 5 are in parallelism and have to do not only with the sovereignty of God, but how God humbles the proud. 
One of the things we learn in comparison of the two is that in the sovereignty of God, God can do whatever he wants to do. And many people misunderstand the nature of God's sovereignty. And many think that God is just a God who will bless. We saw in the case of King Nebuchadnezzar that he was humbled, but he was given time to repent and was ultimately restored after he looked up and acknowledges that God reigns supreme. But in the case of Belshazzar, we see that he was not given time to repent after the handwriting on the wall, but that very night, his life was taken from him. There is no difference in the character of God between the two events. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God does not change. And God acts differently according to his purposes. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, he was humbled but given time to repent. And when he repented, he was restored. But all of that was the grace of God. God was no, under no obligation to restore Nebuchadnezzar. It was grace, it was mercy. In the case of Belshazzar, while after the writing on the wall is given, he was really not given time to repent. He would have been given perhaps a, a few hours to, to repent. But Daniel makes it very clear that all along he should have repented. He should have humbled himself because Daniel describes how God humbled Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest of the Neo-Babylonian kings. And he says, you knew all of this. And so he was culpable because he knew about what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. How the God of heaven and earth, how the God of Judah, the true and living God, had humbled Nebuchadnezzar. And how it was not until Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself and acknowledged the greatness and the sovereignty of God that he was delivered. And so knowing this, Nebuchadnezzar himself should have humbled himself before God. And yet the text implies that he is far more proud than even Nebuchadnezzar was. And he didn't have any right, humanly speaking, to be proud, other than the fact that he was serving, in one sense, as a co-regent, as a king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, from the human perspective, had accomplished great things. He was a military genius. He had extended the Neo-Babylonian Empire over a large portion of the earth. He was a cultural elite who had, who had redefined culture, the arts, and all of these things in Babylonia. He had built and used architecture to, to do things that the world had never seen before. Indeed, as I said last time, in one of the lists of the seven wonders of the ancient world, two of them were in Babylon, and both of those were attributed to Nebuchadnezzar. The hanging gardens and the magnificent walls of Babylon. But Belshazzar had done virtually nothing himself. And yet the text points to the fact that he appears to be far more proud than even Nebuchadnezzar. Now some historical context. A lot of time has gone by between the events in chapter 4 and the events in chapter 5. It looks almost, especially the language in the English text, which uh, several times calls Belshazzar the, the, the son uh, and, and Nebuchadnezzar the father of Belshazzar. So it looks as though 
that Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar, which he was not. Nebuchadnezzar died in early October of 562. He reigned for 43 years from 605 B.C. to 562 B.C. There was perhaps a brief co-regency with his son, Amel Marduk, who in the Bible is called Evil Merodach. He's the one that uh, released Jehoiakim from his imprisonment and reestablished him. Not on the throne of Judah, but he reestablished him. Uh, gave him a, a, a royal stipend to live off of and different things. Um, but Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded by his son, Amel Marduk, who reigned from uh, October 562 through early August of 560. So a little less than two years. Because he was assassinated by his brother-in-law. One of Amal Marduk's sisters, by the name of Kashaya, married a man named Neraglissar. And Neraglissar was involved in a plot to assassinate Amal Marduk. And he assumed the throne in August of 560. According to the royal documents, it looks like about four days after the assassination of Amal Marduk that Neraglisser is proclaimed king. And uh, he reigned from August 560 to 556 when he died. He was not assassinated. He just died uh, after coming back from a campaign. We're not told that he was wounded or anything. Um, we don't know why he died, but he died in 560. And then his son, Labashi Marduk, assumed the throne in 556. And two to three months later was assassinated. The assassination was a coup. Uh, it wasn't done specifically by um, a relative but one of the ones who was involved in it was a man named Nabonidus. And Nabonidus became king. Some scholars now believe that the person behind the scenes in all of this was in fact Belshazzar. That Belshazzar was the power behind the throne. Nabonidus was not a, a young man because there is a, 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 a tomb with a biography written on it to Nabonidus, his mother, who was extremely famous. And her name was Adad Guppy. And she died around 101 or 102 years of age in the middle of Nabonidus' reign, which was about 13 years. So he was probably uh, advanced in age when he assumed the throne. Uh, because of how advanced his mother's age was. Um, so Nabonidus assumes the throne, many believe now, but the power behind it was Belshazzar. And we know certain things about Nabonidus. His mother was a radical worshiper of the moon god Sin. S-I-N. And he himself, that is Nabonidus, was a worshiper of the moon god, Sin. And this did not go over well in Babylon at all. The patron god of Babylon was Marduk. Marduk was the god that was to reign supreme and to be worshipped above the others. But Nabonidus wanted to promote the worship of the moon god Sin above all the others, above Marduk. Now, because it is a religious government, there is no separation of church and state. Remember when we looked at the, the, the narrative about 
the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar viewed himself as a representative of the Babylonian gods, particularly Marduk. He was given his kingship by Marduk and the other Babylonian gods. They entrusted it to him. He represented them and he was to promote the worship of Marduk. And Nebuchadnezzar, from his inscriptions, was zealous for Marduk. And the Babylonian uh, Marduk priests were exceedingly powerful. And so there would have been this massive friction between the cult of Marduk and Nabonidus. The general populace wouldn't have liked Nabonidus just based upon this. And there was a strong chance for rebellion. And so part of his reign, for about 10 years, he resided about 500 miles away in a place called Tima, which left Belshazzar as the de facto king in Babylon. Somebody has to rule in the absence of Nabonidus, and that was Belshazzar, who many now believe was the real power behind the throne anyways. And his father was a puppet king. Now this is highly debated. But what we do know for sure is that he did not live in, in Babylon, but 500 miles away. And as co-regent, Belshazzar was king. Now, many liberals have jumped on this because as we've, we've talked about several times, they're trying to demonstrate that Daniel isn't uh, a prophetic book. That somebody writing hundreds of years later in the Maccabean period, in the early 2nd century, they're writing this book, and most of it is just made up. It's fabricated. Because they don't want to believe in predictive prophecy. That's what it comes down to. They, they are biased against the supernatural Anything supernatural must be made up. It's legend, it's, it's, it's story, uh, but it's not historical. And so they argue here, this person who calls himself Daniel, well, he, he's wrong because there is no person named Belshazzar. Up to around 100 years or so ago, there was no shred of historical evidence outside of the book of Daniel and books that depended on it like a, a, a book called Baruch and, and Josephus, that, that uh, this person Belshazzar never existed. He was made up. Until they found dozens of cuneiform tablets contemporaneous with the events that refer to this person, Belshazzar, and tell us specifically that he was the son of Nabonidus, and that the kingdom in Babylon was entrusted to him by his father. By the way, the word entrusted to him does not mean that Nabonidus stopped being king. It meant that the king gave his son authority to rule as king under him. A really terrible analogy would be King Herod. King Herod was the king of Israel. He was. He was called king. He minted his own currency, but he was under the authority of Caesar. Belshazzar ruled as king, but he was under the authority of his father. Now, if you take the more modern view that he was the power behind, then really he could do anything he wanted and his father wouldn't have done anything about it. But either way, the true king and all the Babylonian texts are dated not by Belshazzar's reign, but by Nabonidus' reign, say that he was uh, the king under the authority of his father. So it is no longer correct by liberals, and many liberals today acknowledge that when it says King Belshazzar, that's fine. There's no historical error with that because he was reigning as king and these tablets tell us 
that that's exactly what was going on. We know exactly when chapter, uh, chapter 5 takes place because that very night was the fall of Babylon. Next week I'll give you the historical details concerning it were really interesting. But we know the exact date when the fall of Babylonian was and the fall of Babylon was October 12, 539. They're able to date it precisely. Whether you're a liberal scholar or a conservative, all are agreed that based on sources, the exact date was October 12, 539. So Nabonidus, through a coup, assumes the throne. Uh, he reigns, but eventually leaves and entrusts the kingdom to his son. And right at the very end of this, because uh, Nabonidus comes to the throne in 556, this happens in 539, so roughly, what's that, 17 years of reign. Uh, this is right at the very end of it. Now, what you have to understand is that while this banquet is happening, the Medo-Persian army is right outside, and they know it. The Neo-Babylonians, under the leadership of Nabonidus, who had taken the army to try to stand off against the, the, uh, uh, the Medo-Persian army, they were defeated in two different locations, and uh, Nabonidus is now running for his life. He's taken off. Okay? What we find out historically is later on, after he basically comes and surrenders, but at this point, he's running. Nobody knows where he is. And the Babylonian army is, or the, the Medo Persian army is right outside. And so it makes it really interesting. Why on earth are they having this big feast when the army's outside? Shouldn't they be getting ready? Well, a few things we need to know is that uh, historians like Herodotus and Xenophon tell us that the wall was considered impregnable. They could have went out there for the rest of their lives and they're never breaching the wall. It was so thick that it was said that chariots could race on the top of the wall. It was incredibly high, nobody's scaling it, and they dug a moat around the entire wall. They're not getting in. At least that's what the... Babylonians thought. There is no way they're getting in. One ancient writer tells us that they had food reserves for 20 years. The Euphrates River ran right through the city. They had all the water they would ever need to drink, and they had food reserves for 20 years. They could outlast that army forever. And so they didn't think that there was anything that could be done. Just wait them out. Nobody could take Babylon, which we see the hubris in this, right? They think that they're invincible. But if we go back to Daniel chapter 2 and we see the, the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we see that God is the one that establishes those kingdoms and he's the one that brings them to an end. And he had already prophesied that he was going to bring the Neo-Babylonian Empire to an end. So it doesn't matter how thick your walls are, doesn't matter how, much, how you know, big and deep your moats are or what kind of defenses you have, if God says this is the end, this is the end. And it's, it's really interesting historically what, what ended up happening. But Verse 1, King Belshazzar, by the way, William Shea, who was a phenomenal Old Testament scholar, has argued that the name that Daniel was given, Belteshazzar, is an intentional corruption of the name Belshazzar. There is no linguistic explanation for why in Belteshazzar there's a T in it. B-E-L-T. There's no linguistic reason why that should be there. That's where the name of the God is, and there is no God by the name of Belt in any form. He's also argued 
that the other names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are also corruptions of their real name, and this was done on purpose. And this was, this was common. For instance, um, Antiochus Epiphanes, who we'll learn about later on, the Jews didn't call him that. They changed his name. They called him Antiochus Epimenes. Just change one letter. And going from Epiphanes, which means illustrious one, which, by the way, is a name he gave himself, to Epimenes, which means madman. So they corrupted people's names for theological reasons, and Daniel is doing that. He's saying, while they may have given us these names, we won't accept them because that's not who we really are. Also, Daniel is called Daniel in here. He is referred to, yes, whom your father Nebuchadnezzar called Belteshazzar. But it's strange that through this narrative, the, the queen refers to him as Daniel. And even when Belshazzar is dialoguing with him, he calls him Daniel. Which makes a lot of sense if his name is actually Belshazzar. Because it would bring confusion in Belshazzar talking to Belshazzar. And there's other reasons uh, if you want to read Shay's articles on it. But King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank with them. Um, I mentioned last time that archaeologists have uncovered some of the palaces, and one of them has a massive, massive throne room that's like 170 feet by so odd feet. It's huge. They would have no problem uh, having a feast for a thousand and this was common. No liberal denies the numbers here. In fact, we have some that are like having banquets for 10,000 people. So he has a 1,000 nobles that gather with them, uh, drinking wine with them. Now, again, we don't know why the banquet's there. Some have argued that it's for morale. Okay, these people have defeated us uh, in two other of our, of our main centers, but they're here and we just need to bring up the morale. They're not getting in. They can't get through the walls. They can't get across. We're okay. We're safe in here. So let's boost the morale and have a big feast. Uh, that's possible. Some think that it just happened to fall on the time when one of the festivals would have been, would have been um, being held. And so they're going to do it at the time of one of the fall festivals. And some uh, have argued, for instance, a professor was at Redeemer uh, University in Ancaster uh, by the name of Al Walters has made a, a strong case for the fact that uh, uh, the moon god Sin, they were actually having a banquet in celebration of, of him. So that's another possibility. Uh, we don't know. As far as morale is concerned, however, I think when the bringing in of the goblets comes, this is about boosting morale. There's a theological reason in why he does this. So he has a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Uh, while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and concubines might drink for them. Some scholars believe that only the goblets that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem were brought in. There's a few things I think make that problematic. Number one, if as the text implies, everybody's going to be drinking out of this, I'm not sure there was near enough goblets taken from, from Jerusalem to give everybody their own goblet. If he has a thousand, a thousand nobles and, and their wives and concubines and all this, there's probably a lot of people there. More recent scholars have suggested that what the text is, it's zoning in, it's zooming in, it's focusing on just the relationship between what's going on and the God of, of, of Judah, God, because he's the only God anyways. But what really would have happened is, all the goblets that were taken from all the different places that they'd conquered were brought in. And each of those nations and their goblets represent that God. So what Belshazzar is actually doing is he is, 
uh, bringing in all these goblets from this country and this country and this region and this one and all the gods represented to demonstrate the superiority of the Babylonian gods to these gods. Now remember, in their way of thinking, when they conquer a land, they don't not only conquer the people, they conquer those, that people's God. And so when they brought back uh, the temple treasures from all these different places, it was represented that the Babylonian gods had defeated those gods. So in, as far as a morale booster here, he is saying, listen, we can trust in our Babylonian gods because our gods have already defeated all of these other places. So let's exalt our gods by defiling all these other gods by using their goblets in order to offer libations to our gods. Make sense? So the focus here is on the God of Israel, the one true God, because he's the only God that can respond and he's the only God that did respond. And Belshazzar should have known better looking at the life of Nebuchadnezzar and what the God of Daniel, the God of Judah, the God of heaven and earth had already done. Interpreting the dream, the, what happened in the fiery furnace, uh, what happened in chapter 4. All of this should have prepared Belshazzar. So he gives orders to go and get these goblets so that they could use them. So they brought in, verse 3, they brought in the gold goblets and that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. And they drank the wine. And what did they do with them? They praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now this is Daniel editing what's going on. He's interpreting for us. Because the goblets of the pagan nations would have been no different than those goblets that would have been for uh, gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. They're just, they don't exist. Or as Paul tells us, what's behind the idols are demons. But they're not gods. And what they do is they profane those things that were set apart for the one true God, for his worship, for his glory, for his honor, and they defile them by offering them to their gods. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. To me, this makes the best sense of why he does it. He is doing it in order to boost the morale of the Babylonians that were there, but also to arouse his gods so that they will protect. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace normally when a king had a banquet the king was in a separate room now that doesn't make sense to us but that's what happened in the ancient world one of the ways you exalted the king was he stayed hidden from everybody but in this case Nebuchadnezzar probably again because of boosting the morale he's actually with his guests and Soon as they do this, there's an immediate response from God. Do you remember in chapter 4? Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 4, verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon? I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. The immediacy of the response of God. 
and he's going to humble him, but in a completely different way. And this should be sobering for us. Because while our eternity is secure in Christ, God may discipline us in the here and now in all kinds of different ways. Maybe God will discipline us in a way where he, 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 he gently uh, moves us towards repentance, but sometimes it's harsh and swift. And if you don't believe me, there are numerous New Testament examples of God bringing swift judgment upon believers. We read, for instance, of Ananias and Sapphira that are struck dead. We read about uh, those in Hebrews chapter 6 that are struck dead. We read about the sin unto death in 1 John chapter 5. We read about those who are sick and dying in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for their abuse of the Lord's Supper. We read about those who are sick and dying in the book of James where it says to bring in the, the altar, the, the elders, so that they might anoint them with oil. And, and most scholars now believe that the reason the elders are called in is not because oil does something you know, specific on its own or, or elders are necessarily more spiritual than the rest, but because the reason for their sickness and their potential death may be because of sin in their life. And by talking with the elders, the elders might be able to expose it and lead them to repentance. And maybe God would bring mercy. So God can humble even us who are in Christ in different ways, and sometimes it's swift and severe. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. Now this is, this is picturesque language in the Aramaic because this is what is in view. That it doesn't say the hand, it says the palm of the hand. Nebuchadnezzar is looking straight up above his head at the wall immediately behind him, and what he can see is the palm of the hand that is writing on the wall. He's getting a close, personal glimpse of what is going on here. So he sees the palm of the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. One interpretation of his knees knocked together means that he lost his uh, bladder control. He just lost control. Most scholars believe that what it means when his knees knocked together was that he, he, he was completely unable to stand. He just lost all his strength. So as this is going on, he's utterly terrified. Okay, we, t we talk about that, you know, somebody who's scared and they're, and they're white as a sheet. His face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. They, there's a, differences on scholars on what that means. But uh, um, the, the, when it talks about your knees and that, it, it really means your loins. So it can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. But the idea is the same, is that he just, he just his, his body just lost control. We might say he was weak-kneed or... or Something like that. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will be made third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now we can see here that he wants an immediate response to what's going on. Tell me right now what this means. The fact that he was so scared probably means that he thinks, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. This is not good. Especially, look at the timing. What have they just done? Okay, one, one commentator, Joyce Baldwin, says, in the ancient world, nobody would have done what Belshazzar had a, had a, had, that he did if they weren't inebriated. 
He said they were so superstitious that you wouldn't have done such a thing. So he, the, the scare has kind of sobered him up a bit, and he's like, uh-oh, I shouldn't have done that. He at least recognized there's some sort of cause and effect going on. He wants to know probably what this means so that he knows what to do. But there's a difference between chapter 4 and chapter 5. In chapter 4, there's two additional things. One, what's the first thing that Daniel says to the king after he starts telling him about what the dream's about? Oh, king, I wish it was about your enemies, not about you. And then he says, tells him to repent. And maybe this won't happen to you. But even in the interpretation, Daniel says, until you acknowledge that heaven reigns, this is what's going to happen. There's none of that here. None. There's no mercy here. None. And some people struggle with that because we think that mercy is required. That God has to give mercy. And we fail to recognize that mercy is a prerogative of God, and he is not entitled to give it. It's a gift of love. We presume upon God. God must do this. So Nebuchadnezzar, or Belshazzar, he's, he's terrified. He brings this in, and what's he do? He offers them the highest thing he could offer. He's not going to replace himself. And most scholars now believe when he says the third highest in the kingdom, this statement is acknowledging that he's number two. That Nabonidus is number one. Well, he can't give his father's throne away. And he's certainly not going to give away his own. So what do you do? I'll make you number three. That's pretty amazing what he's going to offer him here. He just doesn't offer him a bunch of money and say, here. He says, no, no, I'm, I'm going to give you all of this. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. He becomes more pale because it, the situation becoming more hopeless. He doesn't know how to resolve the situation. The queen. Now that's literal Aramaic. The queen doesn't tell us who she is. Virtually everybody believes that this is the queen mother, not the queen. Because of his wives and concubines and are, that are already there, it's highly, highly unlikely that the queen um, would have already been there. And it's probably not likely that his wife would have been referred to as queen until Nabonidus died. So virtually everybody believes that this is the queen mother, which means one of two things. Either this is his mother, one of Nabonidus' wives, who was the queen, so his mother, or his grandmother. While Nabonidus was not a descendant in any way of Nebuchadnezzar, wasn't related at all, not one drop of blood related to to. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, most scholars believe that he married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. And therefore, Belshazzar was a blood relative to Nebuchadnezzar. That's why, most likely, he's called, Nebuchadnezzar is called his father. Now, it doesn't have to be. We know from, sometimes some of the Jewish kings... The, the previous king or, or one a couple of generations before will be called their father even if there's no blood relation. And this was common in the ancient world. Sometimes just because your king makes you a quote-unquote relative just because of the office or the, or the throne. But it's, it's probable that he is, uh, a, that Nebuchadnezzar is his grandfather. By the way, in Aramaic and in Hebrew at the time, there was no word for grandmother or grandfather. It's the same word. So he couldn't have said your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, because there isn't such a word. 
you would use the word father. Even if it was your great, great, great grandfather, there's no differentiation in the language. So often the word father just means your ancestor. So it is not wrong, as some have argued, that by calling Nebuchadnezzar his father, or by calling Belshazzar Nebuchadnezzar's son, that there's anything wrong. There, there, there was no word to use. So the queen is probably either his mother or his grandmother. It may be more likely that, well, either way it wouldn't matter, because both of them would know a lot about the history of Nebuchadnezzar. Certainly Nebuchadnezzar's wife would, and so would his daughter. So they have intimate knowledge, especially of, of chapter 4. So the queen, hearing the voice of the king and the nobles, came into the banquet hall, so somehow there's a ruckus, she comes in. O king, live forever. Now, even if it's mom, that's how she would have addressed him. Okay? Remember, women didn't have any rights back then. Remember Esther for her own husband? She said, don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. Now, remember, that's what Daniel was referred to as by Nebuchadnezzar and and. and that he is one who has the holy gods in him, and the only other person in the Old Testament that that is said of is Joseph. In the time of your father, Nebuchadnezzar, he was found of insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Now later on, we're told that by Daniel, he knows all this, so he should have known about Daniel and should have gone and got gotten him himself. Daniel is probably more than 80 years old by now. So he's probably long since retired. This man Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficulties. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles from my father, the king brought from Judah? Okay, now nowhere did the queen say he was an exile from Judah. But he knows, are you this Daniel? Remember, it's been brought up more than once. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How, how did the, the, the people refer to them? The exiles from Judah. They were anti-Semitic. I have heard that the spirit of the gods, some scholars think there's a, that it's important that the word holy is removed here, uh, is in you and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought to, before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Now we don't know if Daniel already knows what's going to happen. We don't know. If Daniel has no idea, he's probably saying, you can't bribe me. I'm not going to do this for money. But I will do it because Daniel probably recognized, like in the previous instances, this is the judgment of God. He probably already knows the character of Belshazzar and his pride. So Daniel says he's going to interpret it and we'll, we'll stop there. So, so far we have some of the historical background in that. But what I want you to see very carefully is the parallels between chapter 4 and chapter 5. And what it says not only about how we don't learn, that we repeat the mistakes of others, but that God can and does respond to essentially the same situation in different ways. And it's according to his set purposes. So we cannot presume upon God. You know, so many people nowadays think that, that God is obligated to do good things to them. But what did Job say? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's God's prerogative whether he would give or take away. And he's still the same God. So look through the narrative here into what it's telling us about the nature of God and how we need to live in relation to God. Don't just focus on the historical things or, or the judgment of God or the handwriting on the wall, which, by the way, is going to tell us that he was, uh, he was weighed and found wanting. When God weighs you in the balance, what does he find? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we pray that we would evaluate ourselves in light of you. And that, Lord, if we would be weighed in the balance, we pray, Lord, that you would find us to be faithful. That we would live for Christ. That we would live in obedience to your word. That we would live as salt and light, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That we would be faithful, just as Daniel proved faithful. So, Lord, may we learn from the juxtaposition of the life of Daniel and the life of the proud, the faithful and the unfaithful, those who would exalt you and those who would exalt self. There is so much here for us to glean, Lord, and to shape how we live and what we live for, how we exalt you, what we prize. So, Lord, continue to teach us, invest into our lives through the Spirit, through your Word, to make us like Christ, in whose name we pray. In response, let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, which will be from our hymnal number 381. Open my eyes that I may see. Just like the, the king here is faced with a confusing um, vision, sometimes the Lord is speaking to us and we don't understand what he's saying to us. And the solution is the same. We need him to reveal to us. We need him to open our eyes and understand that we might obey what he's asking of us. So hymn number 381, open my eyes that I may see. shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine, Open my ears that I may hear Voices of truth thou sendest clear And while the wave notes fall on my ear Everything clouds will disappear Silently now I wait for thee Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me. Spirits divine, open my mouth and let it bear. Gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare Love with thy children thus to share Silently now I wait for 
for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my heart, illumine me. Spirit divine, open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine.